has been to see a Lumiere before? Quite a lot of you. So maybe like me, you're, you're quite excited. Maybe like me, you're also quite daunted about what uh, is coming next. Um, uh, I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of how Lumiere came about, some of the work that we do um, at Artichoke, and also give you a sort of behind-the-scenes tour of one of our most complex installations that is currently uh, getting ready for, for Lumiere for this year. So um, Lumiere, uh, it came about through an invitation to come to Durham, uh, which was made uh, by Durham County Council to come to Durham uh, to think about how artichoke uh, could apply the thinking about bringing art out of theatres, out of gallery spaces, and into the public realm, and how we could do that in the darkest days in the middle of winter in the Northeast. So, no challenge there. Um, I started my career working in, in theatre, so I was in a lovely safe space like this. It was nice and dry and warm and beautiful lights and nice comfy seats. And my job was to get people over the threshold. So my job was kind of in participation in terms of uh, getting schools involved and getting lots of young people to come. And I um, realized this was quite a challenge because even if you love what goes on inside these buildings, actually coming through the door can be quite daunting. So I discovered the work of Artichoke um, and Artichoke was set up by Helen Marriage and Nikki Webb to work with the extraordinary imagination of artists, but instead of confining their imagination in these hallowed and wonderful spaces that we call theatres and galleries, it was to liberate the possibility of what they might think about and what they might come up with and how that might interact with the public realm and the spaces that we have in the centre and in the heart of our cities. So um, the work begins to... Um, think about how um, you can transform a place, but transform a place temporarily so that we're not trying to necessarily um, put up new statues or new artworks. We're working with artists over um, a, a matter of months to think up the ideas, and then we're magically transforming the space um, uh, so that the audience isn't aware of what's going on until we then reveal it on the first night. So Lumia came about as a one-off um, uh, uh, festival back in 2009. Um, in that first year, we um, uh, welcomed audiences of about 75,000 people, bearing in mind the population of Durham is, I think, about 50,000 people, so already more than the population of Durham. Um, and during the uh, time of Lumiere, we, I think we're now on the eighth edition this year, so comes every two years. It's the UK's Light Art Biennial. Um, during the eight editions of the festival, we have, as you can see, uh, transformed familiar, familiar landmarks. Uh, we have made fantastical waterfalls appear, this one off Kingsgate Bridge. Um, we've brought people together in lots and lots of different ways to share experiences together. And sometimes people are sharing experiences with people they know, they're coming with their family and friends. Sometimes they're coming on their own and maybe experiencing the city in a very different way. Um, so we welcome, all of those, um, we welcome all of those opportunities to transform Durham, but also critically to leave people with memories so that when they leave the city and maybe they return and the lights are switched off, uh, they have lots of memories and different thoughts about places that are familiar and maybe unfamiliar to them. So how does the process start? The process always starts with Durham, and quite often Helen and I work in a very analogue way. So this is a, a very old map of Durham, and we put on little sticky things, and we go, OK, so which artists are we interested in working with, and um, how might that fit with the topography of Durham? One of the challenges about Durham is that it wasn't built to welcome audiences. In fact, it was constructed here on the bend in the River Weir to keep people out, really. Um, so uh, when I tell you that this year's Lumiere, we're expecting audiences of over 200,000 people over four nights, it's not just where you put the art, but how you move people around the city and how you can think from the perspective of somebody viewing that for the first time 
that um, becomes a challenge right at the beginning. And for those of you visiting the festival this year, the eagle eyes of you will notice that this isn't a map from this year's festival. It's one that I dug up from the annals of time. One of the big, big challenges when we're thinking about the program for Lumiere is always the cathedral. Britain's favorite building and uh, an extraordinary um, place of history and worship with over a thousand years of people visiting it. Through Lumiere, we have worked with artists in many, many different ways to transform this extraordinary space. Um, I had the great pleasure of filling it with fire, uh, no challenge there, and I think it was 27 pages of risk assessment just on this one installation. Uh, so this is the work of Carabos. We also shrouded the cathedral in fog through the extraordinary work of the octogenarian artist Fujiko Nakaya and her extraordinary fog sculptures. And actually at the time when we commissioned this piece of work, we brought Fujiko uh, from Tokyo to come and see um, the cathedral. There was a lot of skepticism, shall we say, from, uh, from uh, Durham residents about why on earth we would want to bring an artist all the way from Japan to create fog. It's like, have you not seen Durham in the winter, how much fog there is? And um, it was an extraordinary journey that we went on with Fujiko, who has dedicated her life to working through the medium of fog. And what we didn't realize at the time we were introducing um, Fujiko to this particular spot was the myth of St. Cuthbert's mist, which was a mist which enshrouded the cathedral and uh, saved Durham from bombing during the Second World War. So an extraordinary kind of link was made there. So what do you actually do to transform this extraordinary space? A place of worship where you've got uh, th at least three services a day, you've got very big events taking place. Which kind of artists can manage and can work with uh, this extraordinarily charged interior? This year, we've chosen the work of Rafael Lozano Hemmer. He's a Mexican-Canadian artist. He was the first Mexican artist to, to represent uh, Mexico at the Ven Venice Biennale. And he has come up with an extraordinary piece called Pulse Topology. This was first seen um, in, in Basel. And this is a new commission of this work to fit Durham Cathedral. So the original piece had 3,000 individually programmed light bulbs. It creates an extraordinary canopy of light uh, which responds to the audience who walk underneath it. It literally becomes the heartbeat of Lumiere. As you walk into the cathedral, you'll be faced with a sensor. You can put your hand under the sensor. It will read your heartbeat, and your heartbeat will go through the 3,000, no, we've made it bigger for Durham, 4,500 light bulbs that will fill the nave of the cathedral. So it will be an extraordinarily large-scale, participatory, and beautiful work. So how do we go about doing this? And how do we go about making this possible in a building that is so busy and so old and so uh, well respected in terms of every single stone being protected? So at the point at which we get to uh, a piece of work like this, the work of the curator is done. They've done this extraordinary program, very beautiful. That's where my job and that of my colleagues starts. We have to start working with the technicians um, and with the teams that are going to bring this extraordinary piece of work uh, to life. So in the cathedral sense, you write to probably the chapter clerk and you say, could I have the drawings of the cathedral, please? Back in 2009, the chapter clerk duly uh, sent me the drawings and they were hand-drawn in 1842, I think. So quite tricky to maybe work with the sort of technical um, uh, plans that we're working with today. Uh, luckily for us, COVID actually really helped because we had to do a lot of remote working. Uh, we did a full scan of the building. So now both um, our technical teams and the artists have a full CAD model that they can work with to be able to plan and to be able to do really, really detailed work. But it all starts with the permission. So you've got to go to the, um, you've got to go to the clergy of the cathedral, you've got to go to the dean, you've got to go to uh, what's called the fabric advisory committee, and they want to know all sorts of things like what are the viewpoints? What's it actually going to look like? How are we going to be able to um, continue to carry on the work of the cathedral while you're fitting this up? How long is it going to take to fit up? What's it going to mean? And all of those questions have to be answered before we can get permission to begin work. 
So this year, we produced this extraordinary model using the scan that we'd done. Um, this is a CAD, uh, this is a, 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 an image from the, from the CAD model showing Durham Cathedral and showing how the light bulbs uh, might be able to be installed. So if you think that with the amount of um, uh, things that are going on in the cathedral, uh, the time to be able to rig light bulbs and to still have the thousands of visitors and the services uh, and all of the other events, the, the, the Remembrance Sunday, the poppy drops, um, a lot of the work actually has to go on at night. So uh, Lumiere is in two weeks' time. Two weeks' time will be the last night of the festival. Um, we began working uh, a week ago, and the extraordinary engineers from Unusual Rigging um, are working, probably not quite as I speak, but just about to go to work, uh, to be rigging the extraordinary system that's going to be hopefully invisible to you guys when you come to um, visit the installation. I'm just going to show you a couple of... Is your coffee gone everywhere? It's not gone in your computer. You're all right. Um, uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of very little quick clips of the, of the, uh, of the riggers at work. So this is all of the planning that we've done, and we then start to install the truck work that's going to support the, uh, the piece. And here you can see magically the piece of truss work just going across the very, very top part of the cathedral. So all this is possible through, um, through the work that we've done to, to plan and to use the most modern technology that exists to make this possible. So slightly further forward from the drawings of 1842, here we have a rendering that has been done by Unusual, working with the artist to demonstrate the kind of system that we're going to be using to put this in place. So here you can see, at the, initially, the artist wanted to work at height, but you can't do that in the cathedral and be um, having lots of uh, people coming and going. So every night, the system will come down to the floor. We're going to have to, we have to move the pews. And then magically, uh, it's going to go out and up into the roof of the cathedral. And this uh, rendering shows a woman magically springing into action on the top floor of the cathedral, which won't be happening, just let's say. That's not me zipping up there. Um, uh, and then the audience will be walking underneath it and experiencing the vision of this extraordinary artist. So I hope that gives you a little bit of... Um, some of the thinking that goes into making just one of the installa installations possible. And clearly, this isn't possible without a massive, massive team. I haven't yet done the tally of this year's crew working on Lumia, and I'm going to just refer to my notes because I've got lots of numbers here, and I'm not very good with numbers. Um, the 2021 team, uh, for which I think there were 36 artworks, we had 37 artists, eight riggers, 13 projectionists, 28 crew, 400 volunteers, and 685 community participants. Um, if I tell you that this year the program is bigger than ever before, so the installation that we've just been examining is one of 40 different installations across the city. If you're a Durham resident over the next few days uh, and you're walking around, you'll probably see quite a lot of Maybe things that don't look quite normal, or uh, maybe some street signs that are maybe telling you that things are different. Um, you can imagine the kind of work that's going on to bring all of this together. We think really hard about the memories that that's going to leave all of the audiences that come to visit the city with. For me and my colleagues, we think really hard about this little girl. She's being carried on the shoulders of somebody, that first Lumiere. And I'm sure now, probably looking at her, and we were in 2009, she's probably almost carrying children of her own. What's really important to us is that everybody who comes to Lumiere, whether they encounter it uh, accidentally by walking through the streets on their way back from the opticians or a trip to the supermarket, or whether they've planned to come with their family and friends, that they have a really extraordinary experience and they're left with memories 
of the artist's vision and of Durham temporarily transformed by their extraordinary imaginations. I hope you have a really exceptional visit to Lumiere if you're able to come and um, do think about all of the work that's gone into perhaps even one of those installations. Thank you very much. And almost exactly on time as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I, I mean, I have, I have a number of questions. Um, I guess in terms of the process for finding the artists, and, and, and is that, I mean, is, it, is, it a, is there a research team that, you know, is tracking artists that, that, that you know, sh should be considered? And then do you folks kind of gather together and decide who gets the invites and then... And then they get the invite and, and then see if they respond or, I mean, just, yeah, roughly yeah, as a word. Yeah, I mean, we, um, as a team, so the, the, ultimately the decisions rest with Helen Marriage, who's the artistic director and creative director of the festival. Yeah. Um, but as a team, we all go and see lots of artists' work. We mm -hmm. research a lot of work online. And then we think about the range of artists and kind of expressions that we want to include in the festival. Okay. And going back to my analog map, kind of overlay that over the city and yeah. go, okay, how's that going to work? And how's it going to work to get from here to here? And how do we safely navigate the people sure. through and between those installations as well? So, okay. yeah. And so the, f the first loom year was in 2009, right? Yeah. Okay. And would it be fair to say its success has catalyzed a number of other light festivals to arise from? Yeah. I mean, um, in 2009, uh, light-based work, certainly in the public realm, was really was really rare. Right. Um, it, there were one or two within the UK and a few across Europe. Okay. Um, since 2009, I think people have seen the opportunity of um, light and darkness, particularly mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah. And there are many different light-based events. Uh, not all of the events work with artists in the way that we do. So mm. some of them are, um, you know, much more kind of uh, experiences to fill. Uh, maybe if you don't want to go to a panto, you might go and watch a tr look at a trail and you'll eat lovely marshmallows as you walk around. And, and, and maybe it's an opportunity for you to see um, a, a botanic garden or a historic site. The way that we work and the way that we work with our partners, um, Durham University and Durham County Council, and all of the artists that we work with is to try to look for ways in which light is being used in really different contexts and mm. to kind of say very different things. So this year we've got artists um, talking about criminal justice. We've got artists looking at uh, the environment. We've got artists looking at what it means to bring people together. Um, all of their methods and, and kind of media uh, are different, but they're all working through light. Mm -hmm. And I guess bringing that to the city, mm. you've got this extraordinary tapestry um, that Durham uh, itself provides, both in terms of the river and the architecture, both new and old. So you're creating a kind of melting pot, I guess, for all of that to come together. Wow, okay. So now, you know, given that it's run for so many years and, and now has become really a pretty epic scale, are there, you know, whilst respecting pri you know, privacies, are there, there must have been some uh, occasional near misses in there that, that, that things that nearly didn't quite happen or maybe things that didn't actually happen and they proved to be too complicated and or complex and you had to say it was not going to happen this year. Anything that you can share along in, the way? In, in, terms of, in terms of too complex, we, we rarely shy away from that. So we, 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 we love to work with teams who, who will rise to that challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in terms of how how to uh, things that have kind of you go Ugh. Uh, working with the river is always a challenge. You right. know, anyone who was here last weekend in Durham, the river goes up and down a lot, and um, you know, yeah. anything that is uh, working on the river is beautiful, but it's also quite challenging. Mm. Um, and so we're always you know aware of things like flooding and sure. uh, uh, people who saw the whale. I think its first iteration was maybe 2015. Um, certainly, we had a little bit of a whale swimming away up river um, <laughs> on the Saturday night because uh, the river rose. Yeah. So yeah, that's always yeah. a challenge. Right. Okay. Well, Kate, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>